Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Wilson, Executive Director of Planning, Business Development and International Relations at Index Holding and a member of the DHAD International Scientific Advisory Board, DISA. Welcome to this evening's webinar brought to you by Waterfalls Education in collaboration between DHAD and the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC in the UAE. We are delighted to introduce today's speaker, Ms. Sophie Barbe, uh, Head of Mission at the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC, in the United Arab Emirates. Sophie enjoys a long working experience with the ICRC, extending to over 15 years, during which she took on several positions in a variety of contexts, both in the field and at the ICRC's headquarters in Geneva. Before arriving to the UAE to set up the uh, ICRC's new office, Sophie spent five years at the ICRC's HQ in her role as an expert at the protection department covering detention issues and files of persons deprived of their liberty. She is also a specialist on the fight against torture and other forms of ill treatment. From 2001 until 2011, Sophie built her field expertise in the protection of civilians through her continuous presence in various operational missions from India, Chad, Iraq, Dohuk and later Erbil, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Jerusalem and Bethlehem, Serbia and Albania. She demonstrated a cunning ability to manage operations and lead teams in complex, volatile and multicultural environments. Prior to her humanitarian career from 1997 to 2000, Sophie worked as a financial associate at the Capital International in Geneva and later in London. Sophie, a Swiss national, has a master's degree in economics and a certificate in advanced studies on human rights from the University of Geneva. And she has also participated in regular professional trainings on issues pertaining to humanitarian leadership, international law and protection. Since 2016, Sophie has been a board member of the foundation D-Day, Dignity en Detention, Dignity in Detention, which focuses on the provision of education for children, youth, and women in detention. So this evening's uh, webinar is, is uh, called COVID-19, the ICRC's role and challenges. And uh, later on, ladies and gentlemen, you'll get the opportunity to use the Q&A button you'll find at the bottom of the screen. And at the end, uh, we'll try and pass some of those questions on to Miss Sophie. And right at the end of the presentation, uh, you'll get the opportunity to click for a certificate of attendance. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Miss Sophie Barbe to uh, this evening's webinar. So Sophie, over to you and uh, we'll talk shortly. Thank you very much for, for this introduction. And uh, thank you very much uh, to the participant for joining us today, this afternoon, this evening, depending on the, on the time slot. And I also take this opportunity to thank very much DIHAD and DISAB, as well as the index conference and exhibition for having invited the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC in this very important uh, discussion uh, of, uh, of today. Uh, so I will share with you first uh, a short uh, introduction on uh, the, um, the ICRC, if I can do it. All right. And uh, afterwards, uh, after having uh, presented uh, the ICRC in general, I will uh, introduce uh, the, IC, uh, the ICRC in response to the COVID uh, pandemic. So let me just share with you the presentation. Um, so the International Committee of the Red Cross, the ICRC, um, has been funded more than 150 years ago. It has its headquarters in Geneva in Switzerland and uh, it was established by private individual as a private association under Swiss law and its governing body is composed of private individuals as opposed to state uh, representatives such as the UN. The ICRC is recognized as a humanitarian organization and responds to humanitarian needs of victims of armed conflict and other situations of violence. The ICRC works for the faithful application and respect of the International Humanitarian Law, the IHL, uh, which is composed primarily of the Fourth Geneva Convention, universally ratified, 
and there are three additional protocols ratified by the majority of countries, average of 170 countries for, uh, among the three different uh, uh, protocols. These treaties yeah. regulate the conduct of armed conflicts and seek to limit its effects. They protect a people not taking part in hostilities and those who are no longer doing so, as well as civilian objects, which includes cultural properties. Today, the ICRC is present in more than 90 countries with around 19000 staff members, 19,000 people. In 2019, we had expenditures uh, related to 1.98 billion Swiss francs, which is approximately 2.06 uh, USD. And in 2020, we have made an appeal, a global appeal for 2.2 billion Swiss francs, which represents approximately 2.38 billion. Today, our largest operations in terms of expenditure around the world are Syria, uh, Arabic Republic, South Sudan, Iraq, Yemen, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo, Afghanistan, Somalia, Ukraine, Myanmar, Israel and the occupied territories, Central African Republic, Mali, Lebanon and Libya. The ICRC has been developing a multidisciplinary approach over the time. We have at the core of our mandate what we call protection activities, which are related to visits of people deprived of their liberty to ensure that their uh, condition of detention are acceptable and they are treated and that they are treated according to uh, international rules. Uh, protection activities also uh, consist of restoring family links uh, for people who were separated during armed conflict or other situation of violence and eventually organize reunification uh, of families. It also consists of uh, looking for people and accounted for missing people uh, who, were, who got missing uh, during armed conflict and other situation of violence, as well as during migration uh, routes, um, as well as what we call the protection on the civilian population, reminding all parties of their obligation in time of conflict uh, situation. We have also assistance activities, mainly consisting of delivery of food, non-food items. Also health uh, activities are very core to our uh, mandate, uh, be it from uh, physical uh, uh, health, but also mental health uh, is key in our, in our approach. We have also developed activities related to nutrition, orthopedics, water and sanitation, and many others. Uh, we are also working in prevention, uh, as we call it, uh, trying to uh, uh, disseminate and uh, 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 make aware awareness on international humanitarian law and respecting its rules uh, to armed um, groups but, and also, of course, uh, state actors um, and armed forces. Uh, so it's building respect for the law with armed forces and armed groups. And finally, but not least, we are working together with other members of the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, I will come to it a bit later on, uh, called uh, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, composed of the ICRC, the International Federation for the Red Cross and Red Crescent, but as, as well as with all national societies around the world. We are working the ICRC based on a confidential and bilateral dialogue with all parties and actors in the field. We are mainly operating uh, to uh, support civilians, women, children, and elderly people of determination, and many others uh, vulnerable people uh, caught in armed conflict and other situation of violence. In order to do so, we are extremely, um, I mean, we, we are working as a, as a network, as I said before, with uh, the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement, we have a global humanitarian web network of 80 million people active in almost every country, thanks to the various national societies, be it the Emirate Red Crescent Society here, be it the Swiss Red Cross, the Palestinian Red Crescent, uh, the Kuwaiti Red Crescent, the Italian Red Cross. All around the world, we have, uh, and we have our partners, as we call them, we are sisters and brothers. Uh, and trying to uh, uh, respond globally to various uh, uh, problems. The national societies act as auxiliaries to the public authorities of their own countries, 
as well as support to international needs in foreign countries whenever possible and needed. The International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Cross Movements direct and coordinate international assistance of the movement following natural and man-made disasters in non-conflict situations. Its mission is to improve the lives of vulnerable people by mobilizing power of humanity. Uh, and the ICRC, as I mentioned before, we are presenting situation of armed conflict and other situation of violence. And our mandate is given by community of state signatories to the Geneva Convention and the additional protocols. We are all working with the same fundamental principles, which are humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, voluntary service, unity, and universality. Today, I'm going to discuss and uh, share with you, and once again, uh, the, an important topic, uh, uh, which is uh, on the top of the news uh, worldwide, the response during COVID-19. Uh, we have been trying to, uh, to, to respond as soon as we could, and uh, seeing the impact that the pandemic has had on countries across the globe, Responding to COVID-19 has become a priority for the ICRC since the core of our humanitarian work is to protect, assist, and help people, in particular those affected by armed conflict and armed violence, as I mentioned before. The corona uh, virus disease, the COVID-19, is a dramatic threat to the entire population of the world. While it is a global public health issue affecting over 190 states, Local specific specificities need to be taken into consideration in the international response. This crisis has also evolved into a social economic crisis, resulting in possible increase of the already existing social disparities and exacerbating the possibility of new tensions at various levels. The pandemic continues to overwhelm healthcare system, cripple entire economies, and bring daily activities to help. Furthermore, the pandemic has not put an end to armed conflict and other situations of violence across the globe. Heavy fighting continues in a number of contexts, despite call for a global ceasefire by the UNGA and supported by the ICRC and other humanitarian actors. For the people affected by conflict and violence, COVID-19 is an additional burden to their lives and livelihoods in particular in situations where conflicts have been lasting for many years, resulting in important and long-lasting humanitarian consequences. So without a timely, effective and coordinated response, the potential impact could be catastrophic on millions of people already coping with little or no access to basic services anymore, including healthcare, having lost their livelihood, food security, etc and living in disrupted economies with usually dysfunctionality in accessing the labor market, schools, and universities. As COVID-19 exacerbates the suffering of people living with conflict and other situations of violence, in other words, a crisis on the top of a crisis, the ICRC is stepping up its responses to the pandemic together with the other components of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. As mentioned before, with various national societies across the world and the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement. Thanks to the ICRC abilities of access, its proximity to the population and its general acceptance on the ground, together with the National Society and the IFRC, the ICRC is working to address the most pressing needs arising from the pandemic to meet the needs of millions of people and build on their resilience in the long run. In particular, it is focusing on, for example, supporting vital health infrastructure, supporting access to healthcare, preventing the spread of disease in places of detention while safeguarding the rights and dignity of detainees ensuring access to clean water and sanitary living conditions to populations, including migrants, supporting the safe and dignified management of human remains, enabling communities to have access to life-saving services and accurate information, restoring family links between family members and separated as a result of the crisis on the top of 
uh, armed conflict and other situation of violences and working with the movement partners to contribute to global and local response to pandemic. Along, alongside these direct efforts to contain the COVID-19 pandemic, sustaining access to other essential services and protecting people's livelihood and dignity are also crucial to the survival and well-being of communities. A particular attention remain, of course, on vulnerable groups, such as women exposed to increased incidence of sexual and gender-based violence, children out of schools, for example, trying to prevent recruitment in armed forces and armed groups, people of determination as well as elderly having difficulties in accessing healthcare, people deprived of their liberty, and migrants without having access to basic services, including healthcare. The precariat population has massively increased in a few weeks time and the pandemic has exacerbated the already precarious living condition of those people. The ICRC is also calling for social protection and assistance programs to be maintained or extended for the most vulnerable ones. I will give you a few examples uh, which were um, put into place by many of my colleagues in the field. For example, in uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, in one of the hospitals, the ICRC has finished constructing an isolation area for medical staff and installing synchronization panels for switching between power sources in the hospital. In Iraq, the ICRC has provided PPE and disinfecting and cleaning materials to 27 detention facilities that hold 45,000 people. In the Philippines, the ICRC has helped the penitentiary authorities and the Philippine Red Cross set up and equipped seven uh, temporary isolation centers for detainees suspected of conflict to have the COVID-19. This has proven to be an effective measure in efforts to help curb the spread of tuberculosis as well in the country's detention facility. In India, the ICRC has provided the headquarters of the in Indian Red Cross with 1,000 body bags and informa informational material for volunteers containing the ICRC recommendations for managing the remain of people who died from COVID-19. And another example in Myanmar, Ethiopia and Kenya, the ICRC has installed hand washing stations in various communities around uh, the countries. Well, so the con this concludes my first presentation and back to you Paul and uh, the others. Thank you very much. Merci, Sophie. Thank you very much for that uh, uh, very informative um, introduction to what's going on with ICRC at the moment. And uh, it's very complex. And, uh, and uh, some of the things you've listed, uh, I'm sure we can talk in more detail. And I guess my first question would be along the lines of uh, six months ago, um, you already had a large volume of work, right? <laughs> you already yeah. had a very, uh, a very complex uh, environment that you were working in and people all over the world doing uh, in, in, uh, commendable work in very challenging situations. So something like this comes along pretty much out of the blue for most of us. Um, do you have the resources uh, over the last few months to, to, to manage this or is it putting a, a strain on the resources or if you felt that you've adapted reasonably well to this uh, this new pandemic that we're faced with well, thank you paul for this question indeed it's a it's a key question um, basically when we when we talk about resources here we, are, we talk first about human resources but also financial uh, resources and organizational resources also assistance resources um, Due to the global magnitude of the pandemic and its consequences, definitely these three, uh, these three dimensions uh, needed to be reassessed and reviewed. Um, and while keeping our traditional core activities running in conflict zones, the ICRC had to adapt its operational response by reorienting some of our assistance and protection work to the needs created by the COVID-19 with the Red Cross and Red Crescent partners. 
Uh, one key element uh, when it comes to the human resources was also to maintain our duty of care toward our staff and ensuring uh, operational continuity to the extent possible have remained key for us. Due to the restriction of movement as well, lockdown, curfew, etc., it has been complex to ensure the rotation of our colleagues as usual. We have been therefore working with ingenuity to find the right solution and, and try to ensure as much as we could uh, business continuity. In terms of human resources, we need to have the right people at the right place. And thanks to also our ability to respond in a multidis multidisciplinary approach, and our strong engagement with the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement component, we're still continuing to hard work, um, to work hard to adapt in addressing the growing needs in the best possible way, as well as trying to access the remote places as it was the case before. This, of course, can only be done in coordination with states, with other organizations, in particular with the UN, WHO, WFP, but as well with other key actors and other humanitarian actors. The restriction of movement has also had an impact on the delivery of our assistance to people due to a slowdown or a halt in the supply chain. Access to assistance resources has been an issue, and we are all working hard once again together with states to ensure a sustainable approach. Furthermore, in terms of uh, financial resources, the ICRC, together with the movement, has launched on May 28th a collective global appeal for 3.1 billion Swiss francs, representing approximately 3.20 billion US dollars. From this figure, the ICRC has been appealed for a 1.2 billion Swiss francs, which is approximately 1.24 USD. Uh, USD which corresponds to uh, immediate, uh, to respond to the, the two different levels. The first level is to respond immediately to the effect of the, of the COVID-19, in, in other words, to address the critical response to the crisis. And here we have dedicated approximately uh, 400 uh, million Swiss francs out of this 1.2. And the rest uh, has been a provision to respond to the wider consequences on community resilience and basic services, in other words, for action to address the broader impact of COVID-19 on communities and on the provision of essential services. Of course, we continue to work uh, based on our mandate and our core activities remain. And of course, we have kept uh, some budget, an important part actually, 700 million to uh, activities which are not related to COVID-19. So these are, I would say, the, the, the three major angles from the resources uh, aspect and uh, answering your question. Once again, here we talk about human resources, financial resources, and also access to assistance and ability to move. Mm. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, so the challenges are wide and varied. If you were to say, select one or two of the main challenges if you were really to uh, draw that out could you tell us what the main challenges are that you you have and and how the icrc is responding to that um i will separate them into two categories there are external challenges and again internal challenges um so when it comes to the external challenges of course um even as the COVID-19 pandemic brings regular activities to an end in many parts of the world, as I mentioned before, armed conflict and other situations of violence continue to, 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 to exist um, and have an impact on, on the vulnerable communities. So people already living with volatile security conditions, the spread of this disease poses an additional threat to their lives. As they contend with daily and immediate threats to their safety and struggle to meet their basic needs, conflict-affected people may find it difficult to, private, to prioritize preventive measures against sickness. For instance, in many places where we work, the still existing health systems are simply not able anymore to handle a flow of COVID-19 cases without a massive surge in support. Implementation of basic infection prevention and control measures can be challenging due to the scarcity of resources. 
the access to basic services, including water, electricity, education, etc., who were already an issue prior to the, 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 the disease and the pandemic, are becoming even more complex, resulting in putting further burden and pressure on the still existing infrastructures. More people have become jobless, resulting also in increasing stress and mental health issues on the communities. It will for sure impact the already existing social discrimination and exacerbate the precarious security and living conditions of these people. In countries all today affected by COVID-19, state health ministry may be overwhelmed with the needs arising from the outbreak and thus unable to sustain the provision of medical care and other basic services to the population as another example. So that's one, and that will be the, the external, I would say, uh, challenges. How do we respond to these uh, increased uh, needs, which again are on the top, it's a crisis on the top on another crisis. That will be the external, I would say, challenges. Internally, as I mentioned before, uh, while together with the other actors, we have begun to, to take steps to address the need arising from the pandemic, we face various operational hurdles. Measures taken by state to contain the spread of COVID-19, such as the closure of borders and restriction on the movement of goods and people, although necessary, have resulted, for example, in difficulties in deploying humanitarian teams and delivering material aid on a timely manner. This situation requires to be, to be as flexible as possible and to adapt our response in, the profession, in a professional manner. Practical and innovative arrangements should be collectively sought to create an environment in which humanitarian action can contribute to addressing and mitigating this crisis. So as the ICRC, we recognize that we are not immune to the effect of this pandemic, especially since we, we are work in context with volatile security condition and ongoing humanitarian crisis are continuing. So I think uh, I, will, I will stop here, but definitely logistical, administrative, operational, and other countries, uh, other, other constraints are an additional burden to our operation in the field on a daily basis. So once again, when it comes to challenges, we have to respond to external challenges, a crisis on top of a crisis, and we have also to ensure our ability to respond at the internal level due to this uh, unprecedented situation. Thank you, Sophie. So this might be a good opportunity to talk about collaborations. You mentioned it in one of your slides. Um, I think it's the only way, it's the only option in order to uh, move something uh, more rapidly than we were used to and to bring in all different expertise and knowledges. And we actually have a question about um, working with societies on the ground, but Collaborations, can you elaborate on that a little bit, how important that is right now and maybe what you're doing collaboratively? I, I, I really believe it's a crucial, uh, I mean, this is crucial today. We cannot, uh, we cannot work uh, on silo. It was already the case before. I mean, working on silo was already, had already been identified as a, as a problem and, and problematic when it comes to responding to humanitarian needs which have been growing over the past uh, years, uh, in, in generally speaking. So now with such a pandemic also having difficulties of accessing places, again, because of lockdown, because of curfews, because of restriction of movement, and having difficulties in bringing assistance uh, in, in places on a tight in a timely manner, definitely we need to rely more and more on local resources. And here again, uh, the ICRC, thanks to these Red Cross, it's Red Cross and Red Crescent Network has this ability uh, to work in, uh, uh, I would say, um, collaborative way. Uh, as I mentioned before, we've done a, a global appeal as well because uh, we, we also believe that it's better to, uh, to call uh, together for such uh, uh, an unprecedented uh, situation which has impacted the entire world. Uh, we are not here just talking as for the ICRC maybe uh, more in the past on, on, on situations which are related in uh, armed conflict situation. We are talking in, in countries such as Italy, such as Switzerland, England, uh, the US, all around the world, all continents have, have been impacted. 
and in def definitely uh, in cases where the ICRC is present, uh, as I mentioned before, the challenges are doubled crisis on the top of the crisis. So collaboration is key, collaborating as well for the ICRC with the UN, with other actors, engaging discussion with economical also a partner or actors who are today uh, the who have the obligation to respond uh, to the economical future crisis uh, which we are all talking about is key uh, we are all concerned and uh, we cannot do it on our own and definitely once again the icrc together with the uh, international federation of red cross and red crescent and the national society all around the world, we have this capacity to respond in, uh, in, in a different level in hopefully a timely manner. Once again, duty of care for our colleagues and for the, the, the movement staff and volunteers is key and crucial and we need to take care of our, of our people in order, one, to be able to address the needs, but definitely also to ensure the safety of our colleagues and their families and their communities. And once again, here it's not just about the Red Cross and Red Cross movement, it's the humanitarian collaboration at large with the UN, with other uh, NGOs such as MSF, such as Save the Children, and others in the, uh, in the field, also using and working with local partners. Thank you, Sophie. Sophie, you mentioned in the presentation, and it seems completely logical, about the appeal that you're running uh, uh, very large numbers uh, in Swiss francs in US dollars where would where does the appeal appeal to is it is it governments is it private sector is it donations how does that how does that work how do you run an appeal such as uh, such as this on such a large scale um, over the past weeks I would say, I mean Usually, the ICRC is financed by states uh, who are signatories to the Geneva Convention and Additional Protocol. But we also receive uh, fundings from private sectors and also from individuals. So actually, it's exactly the same. We've been running uh, together and we've been relaunching discussion with our, I would say, privileged partners as at first. Uh, trying to engage also with states, uh, our president, uh, Mr. Peter Maurer, and also our new uh, general director, um, Mr. Robert Mardini, have been uh, working ex extensively on that, as well as all uh, of us in the field uh, at the level of the states and trying to, 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 to re-engage our dialogue on that. Because definitely, um, I mean, the ICRC has not appealed for an extra money or for an extra budget, but has decided to redirect its uh, primary uh, budget appeal of for 2020 with a very specific component for the COVID-19 response. And they, indeed, now the, the challenge here is to receive or to get the money, I would say, um, as soon as possible or earlier than eventually waiting until the end of the year, as it will be sometime. And I think here that's that's a bit of the, that's a bit of the challenge. Uh, many states have uh, responded very positively, and we thank them very much, as well as private sector and individuals who have uh, quite quickly responded to the needs. And it's not just for the ICRC here again; it's also for the federation and the national societies, and broader for other actors uh, working on the humanitarian uh, uh, dimension. Thank you, Sophie. You mentioned some of the countries that have been affected, uh, and, and as you say, everyone's affected. Is this this is probably unprecedented, is it? Where, in fact, when we have an issue, perhaps in a particular part of the world, some countries are their ability to help, to mobilise resources, to to go to different parts of the world to say we can send resources, we can send people. Isn't this the first time where everyone's also having to manage? At home, if you like. So uh, I don't think we've ever seen such a situation where, as you say, whether it's Italy, Belgium, Spain, France, which, whichever country it may be, they're having to look inwards uh, simultaneously as looking outwards to more vulnerable countries as well. This is unprecedented, isn't it? It is. And uh, definitely uh, it will affect uh, generations, I, I believe. Uh, psychological effect uh, are already a reality on, on globally and not just on specific people but I, I think uh, it has it has remind everybody of our fragility 
of our vulnerability. And uh, I think hopefully it has, it has opened doors to more solidarity and trying to be more together. Uh, but definitely, I think today we've been, we've been, we've, we've all been going through a period of, of, of confinement and we realized that it was real, it was true for all, all of us, our families, our friends, relatives, neighbors, everybody can be uh, affected. And um, again, I think it has, it will have an impact on, on a psychological uh, level uh, globally. Definitely, there will be an economical consequences, but not on, and, and this will have impact on the long term. And we need to see how we will, we will manage. And here, uh, once again, I, 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 I hope personally that it, will, it has or it, it will increase this ability of solidarity and, and, and trying to understand each other a bit better. And um, yeah, trying to open the doors to the others. Sure, absolutely. And thinking about the duty of care to your, your staff that are all over the world, um, would you say one of the advantages that ICRC has had, uh, possibly compared to other organisations, is that you're, you're on the ground already. You can see some organisations when they mobilise, they don't perhaps know or have that much data or, or information about what's going on. But you're, you're, you're quite unique in that sense or um, strong in that position that you've had people on the ground in, in many cities across the globe for, for a long period of time. So that would, I hope, is an advantage to um, the actions that you put in place. It is. Uh, I, and I, I've been working in many different countries uh, and, and, and I think this, this access to people, this proximity to the population, is 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 not only um, necessary, but it's a, it's it's a, it's an added value uh, because we we understand we find we understand we try to understand and also working with again national societies on 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 the ground and we have national colleagues working for the ICRC in countries. Uh, you have uh, mobile staff, but you have a uh, resident staff. Who have who are part of the society and who, who are living uh, their realities. So definitely, uh, having the proximity to the population is key. It also gives us the ability to have, uh, I would say, first-hand information wherever we can or whenever we can. Sometimes we we we, we are prevented, or the, the access is more complex for security reasons, for curfew, for lockdowns, as it's the case today. But also sometimes for security matters in conflict zones, and definitely there we have more difficulties to understand what is happening. But still, we have, a, 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 I would say, um, a regular understanding of what is happening around. And this, in this particular crisis, it's key. Uh, definitely having this proximity, having the ability to address the needs on the spot, on the on the top. And together with the people is, is, is always better because you also know what exactly you need to, uh, to, to respond. You can quantify your, uh, your response. Yeah, absolutely. And we had one of our question, uh, questioners uh, talked about the physical mobility um, in these challenging uh, conditions uh, for collaborating indeed in the field. And that, I guess, is, is a challenge on top of a challenge because we've talked about different nations, but in some of the nations you're working in, there's, there's not just the pandemic, there's, there's conflict, yeah. there's, there's possibly curfews, so you can't move around easily. Uh, security, um, having the security with your, with your staff to, you know, they can't deliver good care if they're not secure. Um, and I guess the thing I would add to that is food security, logistics. It's a whole uh, challenge layer. It's a layer of challenges huh, that you're, you're having to manage your staff yeah. as well. Yes, I think as we were, as we were mentioning before, it's, it's a crisis on the top of other crises. And I would say in, in context where um, conflict have been lasting for many years, as we call protracted conflict situation, there it's even more complex because the, 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 the systems often have already been collapsed or are close to collapse. Access to education is, 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 a, is an issue. Access to healthcare is an issue. We have countries today where eventually prior the pandemic, 
we're already running on only 50% of the capacities in terms of medical care. Uh, so imagine today with the, with, with the, with the an, an multiplication of cases in needs to uh, uh, medical uh, services. That is a real issue. Uh, and eventually some medical cares are on one side and on the other side you have another ethnic ethnicity or another, uh, other, uh, other groups and it's extremely complicated to move and to go from one place to another one. So access to health is an issue, access to water, proper water is an issue in this particular pandemic. In some contexts, the access to water is at the, 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 the source of the conflict. So it can even fuel uh, the reasons of conflict among populations. So it's, uh, again, it's a, a crisis on top of various different crises. Uh, and this is our reality today and uh, health, Pandemic, global pandemic, as it's the case right now, ha will have definitely a very great impact on a conflict zone area. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sophie. Um, one of our questions uh, has been asked is, are you currently working with the UAE Red Crescent in, in relation to these activities? Uh, we are in touch with them, uh, we are discussing with them, we are regularly uh, uh, indeed uh, we contact with them. They've been very much engaged in, uh, in, in, the, in the response to the, to the COVID-19. Uh, for instance, they've supported the, during the repatriation of UA national from abroad and the evacuation and repatriation of third country national from uh, countries at the beginning was from China and Iran actually transited through the UAE with quarantine measures. So they've been uh, supporting that logistical support and also mental health support. Uh, they have also launched a set of national initiatives in support to the fund of the UAE, Homeland of Humanity, which has recently been launched in coordination with the National Emergency Crisis and Disaster Management Authority. And uh, they've been participating as well uh, to, the, um, to the, the, the disinfection program on a daily basis. They are extremely active in the UAE and they've been uh, playing their role as a uh, subsidiary to the state. Thank you, Sophie. Sophie, your, your organization um, in the humanitarian field, as you said, it, it focuses a great deal on the well being, if I can broadly say the well-being of, of people in so many challenging environments and the people that are affected uh, by humanitarian crisis so on and so forth what's your what do we need to look out for do you think let's say uh, no one can put a timeline on this pandemic but let's assume that from 10 months from now we're we're, we're coming out the other side of this in in certain countries or the more um uh, developing nations. What would be one of your biggest concerns in the terms of well-being post, if we can say post uh, COVID pandemic, with the mental health aspects, the uh, um, these these kinds of things. I'm thinking along the lines of. I believe uh, strongly that uh, the, the the issue. I mean, there will be there will be many different. Um, factors here, uh, economic, the economy, uh, the worldwide economy uh, will be greatly impacted, uh, putting a lot of stress on people. Uh, many people will be, uh, will, will, will be affected uh, by having, I mean, there will be more people infected, there will be more people dying because of the COVID-19, but not only. Huh? That's also one very important point is that today we are very much concentrated on the COVID-19, but there are other diseases which are uh, still uh, very dangerous, such as the Ebola, such as uh, the, 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 the many different uh, uh, sickness around the world. So I think um, definitely mental health will, will become, will, will be definite, uh, will be, uh, will be affected. The population will be affected uh, from a mental health perspective. But again, I think uh, economical uh, uh, consequences will be globally uh, uh, perceived. And uh, it, it, it will, it will um, I'm not sure how we will, I'm not sure in 10 months, as you say, where we will be, uh, but definitely the, the, the global population will have gone through a, a huge trauma. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, exactly. 
Um, we have one question. I'm not uh, sure if it's really in your field, but I'll ask you anyway. Do you know much about the new signs and the symptoms of COVID-19? Or is this something that you don't really uh, get involved with so much? The new no, signs? We, or, yeah. No, I, I think from, from my side in particular, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on that. I think we, we, we should remain very serious on that and doctors and, and medical team have the, have, have the right response. And this is a, this is a big responsibility. Sure, and this is part of the collaboration we talked about. Absolutely. Let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about how things have changed for all of us. We've all adapted uh, over the last uh, three months, I guess. Uh, when uh, and a lot of us have adapted to technology, perhaps, and we've become more uh, uh, au fait with the tools that we use. We've uh, spent more time on the tools that we use. Do you think that this is also for the ICRC? Uh, have they also started to um, look at different technologies? Has it has it helped you through this crisis? Uh, the way in which you're operating, or is it pretty much the same structure that you had uh, pre-COVID? Definitely, today everything is done via conference, uh, video conference, and the new technology. I would say IT technologies are, are going to be uh, developed even further. Now, in terms of response, uh, often we are in places where uh, the needs are very basic, and uh, the reality is also uh, in places where you have difficulties of access to electricity, difficulties of access uh, to proper, uh, I would say. Uh, healthcare, etc. So here, it, it, it will be a combination of, of, of various things. And again, collaboration with other actors is, will be determined uh, in this particular uh, regard. Um, trying to, uh, to develop maybe new ways of, 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 of responding uh, when it comes to health, uh, medicines, access to, 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 uh, to uh, chain supply, etc. That will be definitely uh, we cannot. We, we will be only able to respond to such kind of challenges with other actors, uh, actually. And I think here again, partnership, collaboration will be at the top of the priority for for the ICRC and other actors when it comes to uh, to, to your question. Um, using new technologies uh, will be definitely key, but we need to find the right way uh, and again respecting also our principles. Paul, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, one of the difficult parts of this, it's all very difficult, but is the, is the management of um, the people that have passed away. And uh, I know that that's something that you, as an organization, perhaps uniquely get involved with as well. What, what are the biggest challenges that you're facing in relation to this? Is it procurement of uh, 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 the items that you need? Is it um, yeah, I'll let you explain. Um, this is something that I would imagine is uh, something that's uh, difficult for you right now. Uh, it is. It is a real issue. Um, indeed, in many countries, the the, the morgues and uh, have become very. Uh, I mean, there were so many deaths at point that uh, there were there was a need. Huh? Uh, so the ICRC has been um, has been training authorities and the competent uh, actors on how to, uh, to, to, to deal with such a situation in a quick manner, because uh, there were some places where it was, it was extremely complex. Uh, here again, we've been distributing uh, body bags um, in order to ensure that uh, the, 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 the dead bodies are properly uh, buried. Uh, we try also to remind uh, all actors of the importance to uh, eventually, whenever it's possible, to ensure that the family uh, or uh, some representatives uh, can be present, or at least that the, the I would say, uh, the tradition and the culture of uh, particular uh, religions are respected uh, even in time of COVID-19. This is extremely important. Um, and also, uh, we've been uh, giving support to various uh, countries uh, when it comes to the morgue and other um, uh, needs. So that, that's, that's what we've done. Uh, there are many countries where we've been involved in that, because indeed it's a reality. And uh, the management of dead bodies uh, is really a, 
and Q. And once again here, one key element was to ensure that people are buried uh, in the most respectful way as possible, considering the urgent situation. Yeah, thank you, Sophie. A, a difficult situation, but uh, uh, you also mentioned uh, uh, the detention places of detention. You mentioned, I think, the Philippines in your how that that's a challenge, right? When you have a again a pandemic in a place of detention, and I know every every uh, part of the world is different, but how do you that balance between people that are in detention and managing a pandemic within a place of detention how, how, what's the dynamics in relation to that what what could be um, could you shed some light on that that experience it, it is a real challenge uh, because it's a close place and uh, often uh, and in addition on top of that often you have overcrowded situation in many of the places that we visit or not many but some of the places that we visit so conditions of detention and, and health in detention is key because when you whenever you have a pandemic, uh, the fact that people are closed, uh, the pandemic will spread extremely quickly. And you need to ensure that you separate and isolate uh, the one who have been uh, infected from the very uh, beginning of the situation. In addition to that, and that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a real issue as well, the staff uh, detaining authorities uh, will be also affected and infected. And therefore, uh, it's not just protecting the, 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 the detaining population as such, but it's protecting the, 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 also the detaining authorities working in the places of detention. Because if they contract the virus, then they go out and it's their families and the society and their community at risk. So it's a spread, it's, it's, it's a sort of, um, it has a different dimension in terms of spread and, and, uh, and consequences. So definitely the ICRC, unfortunately over the past decades, and uh, based on its experience, has been developing this ability to try to support authorities in regards to how to deal with the pandemic or, 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 or a virus in a place of detention, again, because it's a closed area. Um, the, here as well, uh, for, for, for example, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the ensuring to isolate the cases. In the Philippines, we've been uh, doing quite a lot of work together with the authorities and also supporting the Red Cross uh, on the spot, trying to, uh, to create an uh, isolation uh, area to uh, bring the people who are infected and separate them from the detain other detaining population. Uh, we've been also working with some authorities to ensure that family links remain, though family visits were sometimes blocked and halted because of the lockdown curfew, but also in order to avoid spreading uh, uh, an eventual disease inside the place of detention from people coming from the outside, but also from, uh, to protect the outside. So the, the contact with the outside world, including with lawyers, family, etc., try needs to be maintained. So the ICRC has been also uh, supporting authorities to develop further here. We're talking about new technologies, trying to ensure that people can contact and talk to their families, to their lawyers, and continue having a sort of normal life while being uh, deprived of their liberty. And uh, uh, definitely as well, trying to ensure that the staff is well equipped uh, access to water is key, access to health, but that's also the case for the staff working in places of detention, having masks, having gloves, uh, having soap. Uh, we've been distributing quite a lot of these simple items in various places of detention across the world. And we've been reminding this, uh, this sort of, uh, I would say, um, uh, guidelines, not just to countries where we are operating, but that's a worldwide reminder, because in every country today, uh, uh, detention is an issue. Thank you, Sophie. Yeah, uh, certainly very complex indeed. So, um, one of my jobs is also to moderate your time and the audience's time as well. So, I'm going to ask you just uh, three more questions, uh, with your permission. Um, one of them is from the audience, and it's talking about policy making. They're talking about the new normal. Do you do you see do you see yourself having a role in any policy changes in relation to what's happening now, or 
is that not something you you really get involved with can you sorry can you can you re, can you rephrase it eventually yeah they're talking about will we need to create new policies as a result of what we've experienced over the last six months any new policies uh, from a humanitarian perspective you mean mm -hmm. yes i think uh, I'm not sure what to reply. Uh, yes, indeed, we, we, we're we going to have to, to, to uh, operate differently. We're going to have to to respond differently. We're going to have to... Uh, uh, so, yes, I think it's... Uh, it's uh, we, we are Thanks contributing for. today by doing, by responding, by adapting. We are contributing to create new ways of responding and eventually to uh, develop new policies. Mm. Everything's a learning experience, right? There's yeah, always something yeah, to learn. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. So I want to bring you uh, away a little bit now from COVID and uh, ask you about DHAD, um, as you're, you're very much involved with DHAD, um, mm -hmm. our event. And um, what do you think of the, the, the theme uh, that we have for DHAD, which is aid after coronavirus, a focus on Africa? What are your thoughts on that theme? I think it's a very good uh, it's a very good idea. Actually, the the the, had, the 17th edition of the had was postponed next year, so this year unfortunately it will not happen. And the uh, the, the the topic was uh, uh, humanitarian aid in Africa. Uh, so we it was it was decided to keep the, the dimension of Africa, uh, but to link it with the post eventual COVID-19 or I would I would say aid uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, a focus on Africa. So I think it's good we kept the subject. Last year it was on migration, so this year was on Africa. Um, so it's a great occasion to gather the national authorities from various countries and uh, international and non-governmental organizations, Red Cross, Red Cross movement, foundations, charities, academic, to discuss on a, on a real topic because that will be real, that will be what's, what's next, what's tomorrow uh, after the COVID-19 hopefully after, but even not, I mean, what's the consequences of COVID-19 in contexts such as Africa. And focusing on Africa is also key, uh, as we discussed on the impact of conflict and humanitarian crisis, the impact of climate change, population growth, education and employment, aid flows, uh, trade and economic growth, production of natural resources, water, energy, and land health. Such thematics are definitely key also for the ICRC. And when it comes to humanitarian response in normal situation, circumstances was already, would have been already uh, uh, very interesting this year, but focusing on what's next or what will be the, the consequences following the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, start is, is really interesting. And I'm pretty sure it will be, uh, it will be uh, positive. And definitely as well, when we, when we come to, uh, when it comes to Africa, it will be also interesting to see and discuss with countries which, which have gone already to pan full pandemic, such as the Ebola on other diseases which, which have in, in, in impacted their own communities at great level and grave level. So I think uh, that, will be, uh, that will be very interesting. And this next edition will be a great platform for exchanging information with governments again, organization and research institutes on Africa, in Africa, with possibility approaching the debate, by adapting the global strategy to the local uh, conditions. So I think it's a very good, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That's good to hear. And uh, we have a large audience with us this evening. So I, I'll ask you one more question. Um, what would your message be to your, your friends, your colleagues, your, your peers in the humanitarian community? Um, it's, it's a big question. Huh? <laughs> um, COVID-19 is a pandemic, uh, as we discussed, with no discrimination across the layers of society, uh, which will make us, as a global population, humble about our collective vulnerabilities. Difficulties do not only happen in specific countries or places, but everywhere. As we talked before, solidarity and understanding and trying to be together has become a reality today. So I think for me, um, having been working with states, public 
private organization and humanitarian, we need to stand together. Uh, together also with the general public. It's not just specific actors who have the responsibility to act. Of course, we have a mandate, we have a responsibility, as, and as often I say, we have a duty, uh, duty of, 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 of mandate, based on our mandate. But it's not just us, it's everybody. And um, once again, solidarity is key in this matter. So we need to stand all together. We must help countries, we must help people already struggling to provide health care to communities, to provide access to water, to ensure that uh, people will not suffer more than what it is already the case. And I would uh, end by saying uh, none of us are safe until we are all safe. And I think that's, the, for me, that's a concludes uh, sentence on what we are living today. Um, this is a worldwide pandemic and we need to be extremely serious about that. Thank you, Sophie. Well, Sophie, it's been a, an absolute pleasure spending uh, this evening with you. We've had a, a very large number of participants who are all watching now. So um, I would like to uh, thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to, to share all these insights with us, what's going on in the field, what's going on in the UAE, um, all the great work that, that you and your organization ICRC are doing. Um, thank you once again for the webinar. We wish you all the success and all the support that um, you can obtain to carry on this uh, great work. So um, I'd like to thank all the participants and attendees that uh, were with us this evening. So Sophie Babe, uh, once again, thank you from all of us at DHAD, DSAB and Index Conference and Exhibitions. And I leave the, the final word to you. But uh, once again, thank you so much for being with us on this evening's webinar. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Paul. It was a real pleasure as well for me to be with you tonight. Uh, special thank you to uh, Index uh, uh, Exhibition and uh, 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 Conferences, as well as DZAB and DHAD uh, for having invited the ICRC in this particular uh, evening on this topic. This is a key topic. Thanks to your colleagues, thanks to my colleagues uh, also uh, who are working all around the world and to the Red Cross Red Fashion Movement, but also everybody trying to, uh, to find solutions and bring hope to many people who have today uh, been and gone through difficult times. Thank you again, Paul. Thanks. It was a real pleasure having this discussion with you. Thanks to the audience. Uh, thanks to the participants also. Thanks to everybody to have uh, connected with us tonight. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Have a good evening. You too. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.